Welcome to the Sample Chapter Podcast, the show where authors read a sample chapter from one of their books. Here's your host, Jason A. Meiske. Hello, Sample Chapter listeners. Hey, welcome to episode 256 of the show. This week, we are talking with writer and film producer John F. Duffy. John is here today to, we're going to be discussing time with kids before it's too late, storytelling in in film versus writing, and how they're similar, not just verses, but also their similarities. Uh, We're talking about how a box of leftover books inspired his storytelling desire, striving to make an emotional connection with the reader, experiencing the writing as you write it, and then trying to get your head out of that headspace afterwards, because some, sometimes it affects the writer as much as the uh, as the reader later on. And we're hearing about his uh, experiences of writing from life and being real from yourself. All that and so much more. It's a, it's a really great conversation, and it's coming up in just a couple of minutes. Um, I actually don't have a whole lot to share right now, not a whole lot that I can share right now. Um, got a lot of uh, once again, a lot of irons in the fire, so to speak, working on some new things for the show that's going to be coming up here pretty soon. You know, I've been trying a lot of different things out recently and anxious to anxious to kind of put a close, put a lid on some of those things. So hopefully next week I'll get to share some of that with you and uh, tell you about some of the, the fun things and really cool stuff I have cooking for the show. Uh, I hope you had a really good Easter. Over the weekend, I had a fantastic Easter with my family. Meanwhile, make sure you are clicking the link in the show notes for our uh, podcast friends at Pop Goes the Culture. And uh, and if you want to support the show, head on over to T Public, where you can find uh, several different designs for the show, as well as a few other uh, sample designs in uh, uh, that we've been working on with uh, with more to come, more more designs being added soon. Like I said, there's a whole lot that's uh, that's going on in the background right now, uh, but not a whole lot I can really uh, bring out right now. So I guess without further ado, let's go ahead and hop on over to our interview with John F. Duffy. Hello, Sample Chapter listeners. Hey, welcome back. Man, I am I am really excited to bring you this week's guest because uh, not only is his story amazing, uh, but I've been trying, uh, we've been bouncing back and forth for months and months to get this set up. And I am, I am absolutely thrilled that we finally worked this out. We finally nailed down a time and like didn't have to back out last minute because of one thing happening or another thing happening. It's just been a crazy several months. This week, we are bringing to the show John F. Duffy. When John Duffy became a film student at Columbia College at Chicago, he had big dreams of writing and directing Hollywood films. By the time he graduated, he had fallen in love with literary fiction, and over the next 20 years, he found himself in an unusual life path that took him all over America. Currently, he works as a writer and producer of podcasts and documentary films. He regularly writes works of short fiction, and in 2022, he completed his debut novel, which we're going to hear about today, A Ballroom for Ghost Dancing. That book went on to become a 2023 finalist in the National Indie Excellence Award and a 2023 gold medal winner in the Indie Publishers Book Award. When he isn't writing, Duffy can be found sipping coffee with his wife, playing Pokemon with his daughter, and further deforming his ears at the nearest Brazilian jiu-jitsu gym. Ladies and gentlemen, help me welcome to the show, John F. Duffy. Re, 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 re. Airborne sound. <laughs> Woohoo! There we go. Yeah. <laughs> oh, man. Welcome to the show, John. I'm so happy to, uh, to finally get you on here. Well, thank you for having me. I do appreciate it. It is my pleasure. And I'm just kind of like, I- I'm trying to like, we, we, we've been having a good time talking before this. And so now I'm like, okay. Where do I want to begin? Because we were already having like a good chat and having some good stuff. It's like, oh, I should have been recording and then go back and edit. But that's the good thing about uh, editing, filmmaking, all that goes on. We got take two. Try it again. And uh, we're going to have a good time with this. 
So going back, uh, I'm going to start with something really light. Uh, what is your favorite Pokemon? Oh, what are my favorite Pokemon? That's interesting. <laughs> so like I was obviously I'm in my forties. I was too old for it when it came out, but I remember it coming out and it was like mm -hmm. this for kids. And then my daughter turned five, five years ago and she just found it on TV uh, and was immediately like, this is the best thing that's ever been created. And <laughs> she has still been very enamored with it. I mean, she's branched out into other things, but she still very much loves Pokemon. So let's see, uh, like I, it would probably be a nuanced one that like not a lot of people are aware of. It would be like something like, you know, like a, a Cinderace or something like that. Of the, of the basics, <laughs> I like the electric types. I like playing, I like the Pikachu and all that, but oh yeah. yeah. It's it's my it's my daughter's bag and uh, but she's got the cards and stuff and I learned how to play the game because she had it so I could play with her. Yeah, we do. There that. you go. Yeah, yeah. It it was the same thing for me back when it was the the original like blue, yellow, red, all those. And our our oldest son, uh, gosh, he was only like nine, ten at the time, and he got his first Game Boy, and he got Pokemon Yellow given to him, and he did not know what he was doing. So I was like, well, here I'll help you out. Next thing I know, I'm hooked. You're like, scoot us out. Done. I, yeah. <laughs> it's like, well, you can watch me. Look, I no, 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 no. You're you're wasting Pokeballs. Hang on. Let me yeah. help you. I'm gonna help you out by playing the game for you. You join me and follow along and <laughs> just observe. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, you watch. That that worked for a while until the he, we finally got him a different game. And I was like, Well, I'll finish out yellow. You start with silver and gold now. And, it went from there, but uh, and I still I still play the uh, Pokemon Go now with my kids. All of them we battle together and have a good time. And my wife just kind of shakes her head. She's like, "Oh my gosh, you guys with that game!" But then she goes on her games and does things like that as well. So <laughs> I'm, I'm a little like, but you know, my daughter's gonna outgrow it at some point. And it and for me, it's one of those things where I just know that in so many years she'll be a teenager and she won't think it's that cool anymore. And mm -hmm. so I just try to enjoy that youthful aspect of her and like her just being way into, you know, these fantasy worlds. And um, I just try to acknowledge that the time will pass and there will be a time mm -hmm. in my life where I look back and I go, oh, what I wouldn't give for just one more kitchen table game with my daughter, her just sitting there, you know, yeah. I really try yeah. to stick it up. Good. Yeah. And I think that's important. I think that's been something that's helped something between me and my kids it's helped us uh, over the years and now I, now i have grandkids and they're playing pokemon as well and i mean it's just been kind of like a ongoing thing it's been really fun to watch like wow like oh, here's this thing from when my kids were little and it's carrying on to my grandkids now and, and they're all just like oh they got all the stuffed animals and everything too and, and then they laugh like oh grandpa can i play your uh, pokemon go and same thing as back when it was yellow i was like oh um yeah, all right here you can catch this weedle that's over there <laughs> it's, it's interesting how this story from japan has basically uh supplanted you know mickey mouse or whatever you know mm. mickey mouse would have been one of the most identifiable cartoon characters of all time maybe 50 yeah. years ago, 60 years ago and now like my my mother-in-law took my daughter to disneyland only like two months ago and my daughter's like yeah Okay. Yeah, she, she's not <laughs> blown away. Like, and like the idea of Mickey Mouse, I, she's like, I guess I've seen it. What is it? She thinks it's like, you know, this archaic thing. Uh, and, like, yeah. like, and like you're saying now, like, oh, this these Pokemon characters are now multi-generational. Mm -hmm. um, it's interesting how that story, it's a pretty simple story, but how it's really captured like a global imagination and has supplanted, you know previous stories that would have been the thing that generationally would have been kind of passed down kid to kid. Yeah. Yeah. I guess, you know, you're right. I mean, it's, it's kind of a, it's kind of like a little bit of the hero's journey, a, a boy and his dog, a boy and his pet. Yeah. And he's going on a hero's journey and everybody can relate to that on some level. Yeah. And he, he makes friends and enemies along the way. And uh, he's always learning lessons and he's always uh a little too starts off a little too big for his britches and then <laughs> it's gets humbled and then but then learns and grows yeah it's uh it's funny i mean they probably recycled in some fashion the same story for, oh gosh they had for, to, yeah. story for 20 25 years and it just keeps working <laughs> oh my gosh 
So, all right. So you got into filmmaking along the way. You started going into literature. And we were discussing this a little bit beforehand. Do you think they kind of go hand in hand? Uh, one mm-hmm. leads to the other, or do you think it's just really just like no one lane and stay out of the other? I mean, it's, I mean, at some level storytelling, it, it, like if you're into it, if that's important to you, then I think you could probably see yourself doing either or. I'm sure people who are, you know, really into writing novels, no matter their genre, probably imagine that given the opportunity and like the support, they could crank out a pretty cool movie. And I'm, and I bet. It, it probably goes vice versa. Now, the, the difference is that somebody who might be a great, you know, film director or, you know, cinematographer or, or you know, actor isn't going to necessarily have the chops to write something that really mm. uh, hooks people. And of course, you know, someone who's just a great writer it isn't going to have the chops to get it all up on the screen. But when it comes to getting something up on the screen, you have so much help. You have people who are very talented at all the individual aspects coming to your aid. But yeah, I do think they go together in a sense. For me, you know, I was a kid, I, I was just a kid who grew up on TV and movies. I grew up mm. on TV and movies. And I also did read a lot as a kid. And like when Jurassic Park came out as a book, I was probably in, you know, I remember it, or when it was rather, sorry, when it came out as a movie, I was in junior high. And then like the book was all over every grocery store, you know, and, yeah. I, at that point, I ended up reading every one of Michael Crichton's books after that. And I would always get, you know, if my mom read a John Grisham, I'd, you know, she'd hand it down to me. My sister would read Christopher Pike teen mysteries. Like I know what you did last summer. <laughs> so, yeah. She'd kick them down to me. So I did read a lot uh, when I was younger. And then, but, you know, growing up on, on movies and I was in theater in high school. It just seemed like a natural thing to be like, go into film, like go into that. And it also, look, it's, it seems like you're going to, you, you have dreams. Right? I'm going to go to Hollywood and I'm going to make all this money. <laughs> I'm going to be famous. You know, and yeah. when you're 17, that seems really appealing. And then interestingly, when I was in college, I had a girlfriend at the time. She lived in a house up in Evanston outside of, because uh, uh, she went to Northwestern University. And she moved into this house and the previous occupants left this huge box of books in the basement, like in the storage area. Mm. And I imagine they must have been a literature student of some kind because it was just chock-a-bock full of great books, right? It was, it was great literature. Just, they just left it behind. Yeah. Excuse me. And, and so I, you know, she found it she brought it up. She's like, Oh my God, look at all these. And I just started kind of picking out of them. Oh, okay. Let's, let's check this out. And that's when I sort of like really started expanding into like reading the great, you know, the great books. And, oh, yeah. started, and that's when my mind was kind of blown where I was like, whoa, this is what a book can be. You know, like this is the kind of thing you can do with it. Like movie. And I'm, I'm not in any way trying to denigrate any other kind of writing um, or genre or anything like that. But you, you move from being like, oh, I'm reading Jurassic Park, you know, mm-hmm. to now, to now I'm reading, you know, whatever it is, you know, something by like, uh, uh, you know, Camus or Dostoevsky or Nabokov or whoever. And you're, yeah. then you, you see the elevation, you see the levels. And in my head, I got, I think I just got to this point where I was like, wow, the people who can do this are really cool. Like the people mm-hmm. who, the people who can crank out a novel, you know, like, and become uh, in an earnest Hemingway. Uh, that to me just seemed really admirable and really cool. Like these, these people are smart. They are creative. Um, they must have something great going on in their brains. <laughs> I think I just wanted to be like that. So I just, and then I, so I started taking creative writing when I was in college. And so I, I, I you know, my major was film, but I had extra credit hour time that I could do what I wanted with. And I went into the, you know, the creative writing program a little bit. And then there was also screenwriting that I did. And then since that time, I've also done some article writing and essay writing. And so I've written in a variety of capacities. My current job is a podcast producer. I write scripts for podcast episodes. You know, I've written a nonfiction book that I co-authored uh, that was released in 2017. So I've done a variety of kinds of writing, but really that, that thing to be able to make a novel fiction thing just from you, just from your heart that can really 
like just kick, like kick someone in the gut. That just seemed to be like the ultimate challenge. And that's what I, and then, and because it's just you, right? Like I was saying with film, you have that help to get it on the screen. Mm. And sure. I guess you can get an editor. You can get any, you know, you can get an editor who, you know, or some, some beta readers, whoever might help you steer your book a little bit, but in the end, it's all up to you. Every period, every comma, every, every word choice, you know, every writer out there has like sat staring at the page going, should it be? And then they went, you know, just like <laughs> minutia, you know, like, like sitting and agonizing over just a, a tiny detail. And then yeah. when people read it in the book, they just blast right. Against it. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But if oh you've got gosh, it, yeah. But if you've done it right, they can blast right past it. You know. Yeah, yeah, and it, but that's and, and I, I've heard, I've heard it talked about in filmmaking, and and I've witnessed it with uh, with books as well, where it's like, yeah, we're we're grieving over this sentence or this paragraph, this scene, and and then somebody sits down and they read it, and you're like, kind of waiting, like, okay, what do you think? They're like, um, oh yeah, that was yeah. Was, uh, Oh, this other part, yeah, this was good. And you're like, but what about the other scene that I was doing? And it's it's amazing how you never know what part's going to affect somebody, and uh, you know, it, it it could speak to somebody in different ways. But I guess as a storyteller, whether it's storytelling in novels or in uh, movies or whatever, we're still trying to affect the the viewer or the reader in some way uh, with that and sometimes it just comes across in a way that we're not expecting even as the creator. We're trying to connect in a certain way. And mm -hmm. that's, I think the cool thing about sort of the individual pursuit of, of novel writing or you know, of writing is that it gets to be just you putting your thoughts, your feelings, whatever, whatever it is about you and like your very individual and specific existence that you're trying to put into a package hand to other people in the hopes that the things you felt they will also feel and that they or that the things you think they will also think and that you will across time and space you know maybe long after you're dead that you will make a connection with a total stranger in just a moment and that's like that's the coolest thing about it like that you know again you might make a film that really hits people you could be a musician you can make a song that really gets people but like unless you're a solo musician, I guess fair enough, they can do it. But like, if you have a whole band, you know, it's like, yeah, you connected but without that sweet guitar. If that other guy was playing, <laughs> you know, or like, or the, the, the sound, you know, the guy in the booth, the engineer, if he didn't like layer that beat just right, you might not. And with, with writing, it's just you basically just saying, yeah. all right, I, it's on me to put enough fire in this little book that other people when they read it that they they feel that warmth you know mm -hmm. yeah and, and it feels like you know hearing you talk about it with such passion it feels like that's the creative outlet that really speaks to you i think yeah yeah i mean you hit people when they're alone too i mean that's kind of the cool thing too i mean i talk about being alone to write it but I would imagine most people are reading also alone. Occasionally, like I've read books aloud to my wife, you know, sometimes with our, our, our kids will read, you know, aloud with our kids. Or maybe we have a book club and we go and we, uh, you know, we talk about it later. Or, you know, maybe we're in a car on a road trip and we listen to an audio book. But yeah. most of the time, like the person reading what you've written is alone in a quiet space, like focused on nothing but what you've put down. And I think that's, there's something really neat about that. Like you're alone at your table typing, you know, for hours and hours, and then they're alone for hours and hours on their favorite chair reading. And it's just that, like, I don't know, that sort of, it's just somehow weird, like just the two of you then mm. you know, in, in, in a conversation, you know? Yeah, that's true. Yeah. I, I, I picture a lot for me. It's, it's a lot of, it's like uh when my kids were little and we did a lot of uh, sitting around the campfire or, or the bonfire in the backyard or something like that. And they'd want me to make up a story. So I'd come up with a story and be telling them always, they went, I always want something spooky, something that involved uh, you know, one monster or another that I'd come up with on the spot and whatever. And I, I kind of find myself going there a lot of times when I'm writing 
and I'm kind of struggling. I'm like, I start thinking back to that. Like, all right, I'm sitting here in front of the fire, just me and the readers. Let's see where I can go with this. You know, from that, what am I trying to say here? And so it's a nice little headspace. And uh, and then other times I'm uh, I'm I'm doing that sitting in my chair in the living room while my wife is watching something on TV, and then I'm cracking myself up over a scene. And she looks at me like they're talking to you again. So, yeah, yeah, the characters are talking to me again. Yeah. <laughs> it's also you know depending on what you write i mean it's it, it can mess you up you know you yeah you know, you're create if what you're writing is something really heartbreaking you know or really you know sad or twisted or whatever you spend so much time living it in your mind and seeing it first or seeing it again and again and again and again and, you know, right so you can actually put it into text that it takes time to, you can't just put that down and just be like, all right, come on, everybody. You know, like, yeah, you step out of that. Your mind's a little frazzled for some, a piece of time until it recognizes like, Oh no, no, that didn't actually happen. You know, that's not, mm-hmm. I actually lived through. That's something I made up, you know, or that person that I just killed in this horrible way, you know, they, they, they didn't actually die. You know, they're not real. And you know, I've heard, and I don't know the real neuroscience behind this, but I've heard that when people read that the verbiage in the book starts in a certain way, convincing the mind that they are experiencing what they're reading on the page. And that's what Mm -hmm. makes it feel a lot, you know, really real to us when we're reading something. It's what makes us go like, no, when something bad happens. Right. And, but the same is true when you're writing it, you know, and especially when you're writing it, because you write it, Five, 10, 20, however many times it takes yeah. you to get paid. So you're just like experiencing it in your mind over and over and over again. And if it's like, if it's the fun part, you're like, yay. <laughs> if it's the awful part, you're like, no. <laughs> <laughs> and you get in your car and drive off and your wife's like, why aren't you talking? And you're just like, not right now. You know? Yeah. 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 And that's absolutely true. I mean, I've, I've read uh, plenty of books where you really get into it. You don't want to stop reading. You, your heart rate is going with whatever the scene is, because it could be the finale or it could be some, the monster just showed up the first time you get to see what's going on. Um, and at the same time, like in my, my first book, I have a, uh, I have a scene where something is revealed and I kind of glassed over it in my first drafts and second draft. I still didn't really want to go there. And my wife was my first reader and she was coming back to me later on saying like, you know, the guy here that you're revealing is to be kind of a monster himself. Like this doesn't, this isn't representing that she's like, you're going to have to like really make this bad so that people understand this is not a good guy. And uh, so I was like, okay, yeah, you're right. And I had to think about it. And then it was like, okay, let me, let me pour a drink and take a few sips and then, okay, let's see where we go. And when I was done, I knew I got it but I was ready to take a shower. I am like, <laughs> yeah. I am not happy with this scene, but at the same time, yeah, it, it had to happen so that I can really evoke those feelings like we were talking about. And yeah, this was not a good person. And yeah. my wife read that later on. She was like, yep. Oh yeah. You nailed him. That, that's the way it's supposed to be. I was like, All right, yeah. cool. <laughs> so, and it sounds like, uh, you know, kind of, move over here to ballroom for ghost dancing it sounds like feelings and touching on on experiences is something you brought into into this so tell us about uh, the history of ballroom for ghost dancing so i wrote it uh, as a birthday present to myself uh for when i turned 40 and i had not uh published a novel at that point i had written one that I never did anything with. And I wanted to try another. And I just kind of knew it was sort of time. And like I said earlier in this, I wanted to be a writer and thought they were super cool and all that going well back to when I was in, you know, maybe college and when I was like 20. And, but I hadn't really made myself do it yet. And Mm. I had written that one novel that I put away you know, I finished, I got it to the end, but I just didn't know what to do with it. And I, I think it was a good practice book. Mm. And 
then I started writing a bunch of short fiction just to, again, hone my abilities and to um, just enjoy writing because sometimes it's just a great catharsis. And then I started getting those published. And so I've had, you know, a lot of like short fiction stuff published. And then I, the novel, I was like, it's, it just felt like it's time. I'm, you know, this is when I, you know, I'm going to transition into full on writing novels. And, and I just sort of knew it because I had a friend who died and he was in his thirties and he's a guy I went to high school with and, you know, and I'm very good friends with his cousin who he grew up with like a brother. And I knew I wanted to take some element of their story and turn it into a novel. And the, my friend who is the cousin who's still alive, he cared for my other friend as he was dying. And it was about a year long process, like a neurodegenerative condition. And he was one of his caregivers and it was a heartbreaking process for him. And by the end, he was really shattered emotionally by the whole thing. And yeah. it was doubled down on the fact that his longtime girlfriend left him in that period. And he was just, you know, sort of a wreck as one would imagine. Yeah. And he and I took a trip and it was something that I just kind of threw out to him. I'm like, let's just go somewhere. And somewhere we have no reason to go that we've never been. Let's just do it. And we ended up going to Duluth, Minnesota, and we had a good time, and we we came back, you know, we came back, and then it was after that that I was like, I think there's something here. I think there's a there's a good book here, and I I, I fictionalized them, you know, I changed a lot of their circumstances, but I kept the sort of the heart of that, <laughs> and so it becomes a story about that starts as there's one man who has lost his brother and lost his longtime girlfriend and he's heartbroken and his best friend from life is inviting him on this trip to South Dakota. And he's like trying to get him to shake off his shake off the dust. He's like, wants them to change venues, get out of the city he lives in, see some new stuff, experience some new stuff and hopefully find a new uh, energy for living. Uh, and mm. And that's so, and that's where it sets off. And then, so interestingly, I I thought of the entire plot, and it, it it you know came to me pretty quickly. I was like, okay, this to this to this, and then I knew that I wanted to make them go to South Dakota uh, to the Badlands, and I had all these ideas for interweaving different metaphors and things like that. So I actually took that trip to the Badlands with that friend. I was like, all right, the, if, you know, a year or two had passed since that first trip we'd taken when he actually yeah. really was heartbroken. And I was like, hey, man, this might sound weird, but I want to write a book. And it's kind of about you. <laughs> but <laughs> let's, like, let's take a trip again. But now we're going here. We're going to we're going to go to Rapid City and we're going to see the Badlands. And he was like, all right. You know, and so we just here we spent, you know, five or six days on the road and went out, check it out. And that was my way of seeing it so i could so i could write it you know i went to the badlands and i got literature on their flora and fauna and i looked at the mountains i went to the cities and i walked around and i gathered up all the knowledge i would need research wise to actually write mm. those accurately yeah i mean you know the, and the reviews are coming back at how touching it is it hooks people from page one um it's, it sounds like it's one of the things, one of the things I, I have come to believe is, you know, you're right what you know. And, you know, and this is something that I think really, you know, speaks from you from experience. Uh, like you said, you're fictionalizing this. So you're writing something that you do know and writing from the heart and uh, it, it's coming forward. What was, what was one of the toughest parts for you, toughest things for you to deal with when writing this? Hmm. I don't, I don't feel like actually the actual writing of it was difficult. I actually was able to get a draft out in three weeks. And hmm. I, because like I said, like it was one of those things that I just knew where it needed to go. And yeah. I knew, I knew I was going to go from point A to like point Z and I knew what B through Y, you know, all that were along the way. It is yeah. because, because I had just sat and thought about it. 
and things just made sense to me. I think the harder thing is fear. And I think most people who write experience this, you know, if you're writing for someone else, not just journal, but if you're writing for people and you're hoping that they like it, it's hard to not be very self-critical every step of the way to not sit mm. there and eh, people don't like that. Or like you do, you do this, or are people going to say that's bullshit, you know, and you just, the harder part is just taking that voice and putting it in a little cage and saying like, I will unleash you on this later, <laughs> you know, but, but right, <laughs> you just need to stay there. Yeah. And just doing what you like, writing, writing how you think you, it should be and how it like, how would you actually like it? Not be worried about what other people are going to think. Because mm -hmm. the news is, the good news is, there will always be people who hate whatever you do. <laughs> you <know>? what, <laughs> what you do will not be for everybody. It's about, but if you write in, like, I take this, like, I don't know if you know who Rick Rubin is. He's a very famous music producer. And he's mm -hmm. like, yeah, I don't know. He's said and done some very cool things just about art um, that I find very inspiring where he's like, audience comes last like do what you like because if you do what you like you will find people that it resonates with if you do something where you're trying to please a lot of people all at once you're probably gonna fall flat with, with all of those people because it's they're all gonna feel like it's not quite for them but just do what's for you and find your audience don't worry about it. and like and i think that so going back to the question of what was difficult is just taking all those voices of self-doubt and putting them aside while you go through and, and get it done, you know, draft one, draft two, draft three, draft four. And at the very, very, very end, you know, it, it, maybe it's time to look at it and say like, will this be considered too corny or something like that? Or will this, <laughs> yeah. will this be considered cliche? And, and then you ask yourself like, well, maybe it will. But I actually don't care because I think it's right, you know, or whatever. Um, yeah. And maybe in the end, you let some of those voices like have a little bit of say. But, but I think it's actually probably even more positive to just bring in some other people at that point and have actual other people look at it. Mm -hmm. um, because a thing happens when you write where you read what you're writing so many times that if you start to just hate your own work or you start to look at it and go, I'm pretty sure this sucks, <laughs> you know, because like. <laughs> <laughs> it just, it's, 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 your, it's just because you've looked over it so many times. And so sometimes it's, yeah. kind of, you know, and I did do that. I had a couple other people hop in and you know, people whose opinions I respect. And then a couple of just complete strangers and had them tell me what they thought and made some, I actually did make a handful of changes, mostly on the, the, you know, when they, when they brought them to me, I was like, you know what, that's right. And just, and they almost all revolve around just shortening certain stuff, just like taking it down. And, mm -hmm. and that was, I think, great advice now that I look back on the finished product. Yeah, and I think that's I think that's really important to have that open mindedness to to understand nobody's trying to break your work down and, and be mean. Uh not when you find the right people. Uh and if you can just take it in and hear what they're saying and and just determine whether or not to apply it or not, but at least just see where they're coming from. So that yeah. way you can determine, okay, should I make this change or should I not? You know, and sometimes people go like, I, I've, and I've fallen into this too, where it's like, somebody's like, well, you know, but I don't understand this. They have this, what is their motivation here? What's going on? I'm like, Oh, well, but this and this and this, and they've been through this in the past. And they're like, oh, I didn't know that. And I'm looking at them going, that's right. I took all that out to shorten this down and the reader has no idea what's in my head. Yeah. But I'm a, I do. And it is, yeah, it's being open to take that in is, is something we got to learn to do. You should be willing to just have it be challenged and meet the challenge. If someone looks at something and says, look, like you've, you've just overly expressed this here. It's like, we get it. Mm. We just move on. And you might look at it and go, no, I'm, I'm, I have to keep that because it's important. It is actually important for reasons A and B. Or, you know, you look at it and you go, mm, maybe I just kind of fell in love with the way I worded that and I kept it in. 
reason and that's not a good reason and so yeah i do need to take this out so we can so, yeah. so move on and not let our reader get bored yep yeah be real with yourself yeah i like that i like that so so what is next for you so um i have written uh another novel it's uh so it is tentatively titled where when it rains but i don't know like on the off chance some publisher takes it and is like we really love this one to publish it, but we're changing the title. <laughs> like maybe, <laughs> maybe that would happen, but I, I hope not. Um, but I'm really excited about it. It's a different kind of book than this one. This book, A Ballroom for Ghost Dancing, is very, I think, uplifting. It starts in sort of a dark place, but it's very life affirming. It's a book about grief and loss, but it's about it's about living with grief and loss. And still knowing that it's okay to be happy and it's a good thing to be happy and to, to strive for that. And so it's an uplifting book. And I wrote, and I just, I had a very certain style where I was like, I want to write something that reads fast. That's not complicated. That's not up my butt, sniffing my own farts with language and like, you know, and mm -hmm. flirt, you know, of you know being really verbose or anything i wanted it to be something that anyone could just grab and read it and they can read it in a day and feel pretty good at the end of it and get maybe get a couple laughs along the way a couple tears whatever the next book i've written is more challenging and i think i still have stuck to my my style for the most part which is again to be um to be more spare with words at times, uh, not in, not entirely. So like, there, you know, I, I take my moments to get poetic, but uh, I think the things I write read, um, I, I try not to make them too overly complex. I want people to be able to sit down and, and get through it and turn the pages and be getting something out of it. I, I don't know. I, 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 that's just a stylistic preference, but this new one is, I wouldn't say nearly as uplifting, <laughs> and is more populated with uh, flawed humans. And I don't, they're not awful. They're not, they're not, you know, they're not terrible people. They're not like people that deserve, you know, the, the, the deep dungeons of the world or anything, but they're, <laughs> they're, but they're very, they're real. And, and it's also based uh, on my life, just a different part of my life. And then again, like very fictionalized and very exaggerated to, you know, be interesting enough for people to want to get to the end. But um, I'm very excited about it. I think I've, you know, I, I read back through it after putting it away for a minute because I was starting to send it off uh, for agent queries. And I read through it again at, at, and it got to the end. And I was like, this is actually pretty good. Um, but it's much more of a slow... It, I just said it reads fast, but I'm going to now say it's a slow burn. It's one of those things where, <laughs> oh, in the sense of the plot structure. Um, right. Ballroom for Ghost Dancing was easy for me to write because it is a very chronological book. It's a one-week road trip with two best friends. So there's mm -hmm. like a lot fewer characters, and I know it's day one, day two, day three, day four, day five, day six, day seven, and this is what happens. This <laughs> other thing, my next one takes place over the course of multiple years. It's a, a lot more characters. It's and so it's the hard thing for me on the cell is when you know trying to be like read these first 10 pages, read, read these first 30 pages, and it doesn't just reach out and grab you by the throat, you know, and say, like, you know, this my first book is get in the car, we're going, and my second book <laughs> is let's look back on this period of time in this person's life and go through it, and that's uh, maybe not as yeah, it's it, I guess it's just. A harder sell in a certain sense but i also think very very rewarding um mm -hmm. by oh good good we're working it's boring until the end <laughs> until the end yes <laughs> and then it gut punches you <laughs> <laughs> well where can people uh find and follow you to uh to find out like when this is your next one will be available Great question. So I do keep a Twitter profile that I don't use very much. Um, and that's at smashed ears. Like 
my honest feeling is that Twitter is a miserable place. And like, if I ever go on it, I always leave feeling worse. So I'm like, why would I spend any time here? But I do put my, um, like when I do book festivals, like I did Louisville book festival, Chicago printers row book festival. Like when I do things like that, I will post it on there. Uh, so, so people can follow that. I have an Instagram that's also at smashed ears. And so you could do it there. It would also go up on Instagram. I have a website, John F Duffy.com. That's just for writing. So, uh, there's links to the different places where my short stories are there as well. And, and yeah, so those are probably the, the best options. Um, so Perfect. Yeah. And of course, I'm going to have links for all that in the show notes, everyone. So you can uh, click in there and follow John on all these places. Uh, John, this has been fantastic, man. I, I feel like we could just chat for, for a good long while here and uh, about storytelling and movies and, and all sorts of stuff. Uh, but uh, yeah, it's, it's about time to move along. Hey, everybody, don't forget to hit that subscribe button so you don't miss out next, next time. When we're back again with John Duffy and uh, you're going to hear that sample chapter from A Ballroom for Ghost Dancing. Meanwhile, John, thank you so much. And uh, everybody, we'll talk to you again real soon. Thank you so much for having me on. Appreciate it.